Our speaker for today is Dr. Jonathan Koch Uhuad of the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Dr. Uhuad was born actually in Sison, Pangasinan, and later immigrated to the US when he was a child and he grew up in Hawaii. He earned his BA Geography and BS uh, Environmental Science degrees from the University of Hawaii as a Chancellor Scholar. For his uh, undergraduate internship, he got a National Science Foundation grant to study the endemic bees of Hawaii on the volcano Mauna Loa. To pursue his graduate studies, he moved to Utah State University where he worked with the USDA Agricultural Research Service Pollinating Insect Research Unit to study the North American bumblebees. Sir John earned his MS Biology in 2011 and PhD in Ecology in 2015. After completing his PhD, he received an NSF postdoctoral fellowship to study the invasion genomics of the globally invasive pest, the spotted wing Drosophila. That's in Hawaii. For his second postdoc appointment, he was awarded a David H. Smith postdoctoral fellowship to sequence the genomes of endangered and non-endangered bees endemic to Hawaii. And as of date, he has published 27 peer-reviewed scientific articles, a field guide to the bumblebees of the Western United States, and has given over 100 academic presentations worldwide. He, acti he actively serves with the IUCN Species Survival Commission, Southeast Asia and North America, Bumblebee Groups, and the Entomological Society of America, Entomology Games Committee. And as a research entomologist with the USDA, ARS in Logan, Utah, he leads a research program that aims to deliver cutting edge scientific tools and innovative solutions that promote bumblebee sustainability and availability to farmers, producers, and industry in the United States and abroad. So everybody, let's all welcome Dr. Jonathan Kosh Uhad. Sir John, you may take the floor. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Share screen. All right, so hopefully my screen now is coming through. Yes, it's okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, Maganda Umaga, colleagues and guests of the University of Philippines Los Banos Museum of Natural History, and good afternoon and aloha ahi ahi to colleagues, friends, and family around the globe. I'm so happy to be part of this seminar series. I would first like to thank Director Gonzalez for the kind invitation to participate in this seminar series to present my research. I would also like to thank Jessa Atta and Marcel Hardalisa for connecting me to the museum and supporting this opportunity. Today, I'm gonna to share with you a bit about my own journey in bee research and then briefly present the natural and agricultural history of bumblebees. I'll also present one project that I have led to uncover genetic diversity in bumblebees in North America, and a second project with Dr. David General at UP Los Banos on Philippine bumblebees. Finally, I will close my seminar on some thoughts on future projects that could be pursued collaboratively with Philippine scientists on Philippine bumblebees. So like our human family, bees are an immensely diverse group of insects that are brightly colored, come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and have a diversity of different lifestyles. These photographs represent a diversity of different bees that you can find across our planet. But of course, it is just a mere drop in the bucket, as there are 20, more than 20,000 described bee species. Now, I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about bees, most definitely. But I first want to present to you some photos of my family and friends, people who have supported me during my studies and my career. And I also want to give a special shout out to my nephews who live in Hawaii and who are likely watching this talk today. So everyone here today is on, on, on some sort of journey. And today I'm going to share with you my journey as a scientist, which really began after I graduated from high school in 2003 and started my undergraduate studies at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. This is a photograph of me on Mauna Loa Volcano with Mauna Kea Volcano in the distance. And at this moment in time, I'm taking some notes 
uh, on some insects that I observed visiting those plants that you see in the background. And it was during this time where I was introduced to the world of bees, specifically through this small uh, bee called Hylaeus. It's in the family Coletidae. It's the yellow-faced bee of Hawaii. And what I did was I watched this bee visiting flowers in the field. And by watching these bees visiting flowers and the flowers being visited by bees and other animals, it was the first time that I learned that science can actually be a career that I pursued. So as an undergraduate at the University of Hawaii, I got to spend a lot of time hiking through the forest, observing flowers and insects, and hiking across old lava flows. Now at the time, I was really passionate about insects and bees, and I wanted to learn more after my undergraduate studies. And my advisor at the time suggested that I had to move away because there were other expertises out there that I could gain. Um, knowledge from about bees, which brought me uh, to Utah, to Logan, Utah, to work at Utah State University. And it was at Utah State where I studied bumblebees, which is an insect that I've never seen before in my entire life. There are no bumblebees in Hawaii. And the questions that I was tasked with included, are bees, bumblebees declining in North America? How much are they declining? Why are they declining? And of course, for the purpose of today, who are the bumblebees? At that time in 2008, I had no idea what a bumblebee was. So today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about what I've learned since then. Now, bumblebees belong to a group of bees um, that have corbiculae or corbicula, the corbiculate bees. And this corbicula is a, a modified structure on the hind leg of a bee that enables it to carry pollen. So bumblebees have a corbicula, Orchid bees have corbicula and honeybees have corbicula. And you can see here in the images, you can see the pollen on the hind legs of the bees. So the bees are able to take pollen collected from flowers and then pack that into their corbicula, into their pollen basket on the hind legs. Now bees, um, the bumblebees belong to the group of bees called the Anthophila. And the Anthophila arose during the Cretaceous period, about 65 to 144 million years ago. This picture you see in front of you is a phylogeny. It's basically the tree of life for bees. It's a way to look at the relation, evolutionary relationships between bees on this tree of life. And what I like to think about when I think about the fact that bees around, um, came to be during the Cretaceous is that bees basically came to be when dinosaurs were still on our planet. So I think that's always kind of exciting to think about that dinosaurs and bees were around during the same time. Of course, I'm not gonna talk about all 20,000 bees today. I'm only gonna talk about bumblebees specifically. And the initial diversification of bumblebee lineages that we see today came about starting 25 to 40 million years ago near the Eocene and Oligocene boundary. This was a period of dramatic global cooling. There were mammals on the planet at the time, and of course there are mammals here today. Now, bumblebees, like other insects, are highly diverse, high, very colorful. Um, there are many common names across the planet. Of course, my favorite is the babuyog in the Philippines. Uh, they are hairy. And as you can see, all of these photos represent different types of bumblebee, um, phenotypes, different types of colors that you can find at any given point on our planet. Um, people tend to notice them because they're quite large and hairy and robust. Here's a map of bumblebee species richness or the number of different bumblebees you find in a specific area. The hotter colors on this map represent areas where you have high species richness, whereas the cooler colors, the blues and the greens, represent areas with low species richness. So you can see, based on that information, that bumblebee species richness, or the number of different types of bumblebees, are highest in the continental parts of Asia um, and Europe. So you can see here in the Sichuan provinces of China, province of China, high species richness of bumblebees, as well as in Northern Europe. In North America, where I live, bumblebee richness is actually quite low in comparison uh, to Europe and Asia. And then of course, in the Philippines, there are at least two described species of bumblebee res residing there. Now, bumblebees are very fascinating because they form these colonies 
uh, and that can be found underground or in a tree hole. So the colony to your right on your screen is a colony of Bombus huntii. So you can see the Bombus huntii nesting or incubating their, the, the offspring here. The offspring are found in these cells. So they're incubating their nest, incubating the offspring produced by the queen. And these are um, examples of uh, bees that we work with in the lab. Now, if we were to go into the wild, of course, bumblebees, of course, use materials from nature to help insulate it. So you can see this bumblebee colony here. You can see a couple of bumblebees scattered throughout, and they actually use woody material to help insulate the nest. So that way the nest stays warm and helps with the production of offspring. Now, if you were to go into a colony yourself and take a peek inside, you will find a lot of activity and the fact that this entire colony is a bee-made structure, a structure that is composed of wax that the bees produced. It is within the colony where eggs are laid, larvae are cared for, and adults hatch. It is the place where workers bring in pollen and nectar from the environment to feed developing offspring. The colony is their home, a place for growth, a place for their specific family. Now, here's a nice uh, video hopefully it'll slowly come through um, online. You can see some bumblebee activity of, uh, of Bombus huntii. Um, we use red light when we're observing them so they don't fly in your face. You can probably see the larger individual to the, uh, the right bottom portion of the screen. That's the queen bee surrounded by her offspring, the workers, and they're all helping keep the colony warm and keeping the brood warm so they develop correctly. Now, when you think about bumblebees, another thing to imagine is the fact that the way they develop is not always within a colony. There are portions of the life cycle of the bumblebee that does not involve a colony. And in fact, the bumblebee colony's life cycle follows the rhythm of the seasons, follows the rhythm of nature. So here in Utah, it is March. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have spring as the snow melts and the temperatures get warmer. So right now, there are no bumblebees flying in Utah. They're all underground. The queens are still underground, waiting for the warmth to come, waiting for resources to be available to them. And once that time hits, once it becomes warm enough to fly, once they have enough food resources available to them, the queens will leave their underground hibernacular, their resting place, and then search for a nest. And when they find a suitable nest, as indicated by um, letter B here, picture letter B, um, they will gather pollen and nectar, and then they'll rear offspring that they lay into that pollen that they've collected. The eggs will eventually hatch, um, in, as in letters, depicted in letter C. The eggs will hatch into larvae, they will grow up, start to develop, and eventually emerge as adults. And, when they're, and those adults that hatch out will eventually go on their own flights to look for uh, pollen and um, nectar and bring that back to the colony while the original queen does all the work of um, laying eggs. And this will happen for many weeks throughout the year. But towards the end of summer, in North America at least, around July and August, they'll switch to reprodu producing reproductives, male, uh, new queens and males. And those queens and males will eventually leave the nest. They'll go on their own mating flights, find other colon uh, others, um, individuals from other colonies, um, they will mate. And then that new queen will find again a place in the ground to, to rest over the winter um, and to protect herself. And then everybody else, the males, the old queen, the workers, they all pass away, they all die. It's only that new queen who's been mated that actually survives that wintering phase. And then of course, the cycle begins all over again. So now I've briefly talked to you about the uh, natural history of the bumblebee, which I hope was very exciting and interesting for you. And now I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about the history of its domestication. Over the course of human history, bees, including bumblebees, have been used by humans to meet their dietary and agricultural needs. And one bee in particular that's quite famous, of course, is the honeybee. And humans have been managing honeybees for quite some time. In fact, there is evidence uh, via Egyptian hieroglyphics of people managing honeybees in clay pots as early as 2400 BCE. 
this was quite a long ago, long time ago, and people were already managing honeybees, so that way they can extract their honey um, and other things that they found desirable. But for bumblebees, it has only been within a little over a hundred years since the early 1900s where we've been trying to manage bumblebees for our own purposes, specifically to deliver pollination services in agriculture. And it was a gentleman named F.W.L. Sladen who used wooden boxes to keep bumblebees alive and rear the colonies out and observe them in real time. And the reason why people were interested with bumblebees is because bumblebees are able to pollinate flowers with long corollas due to their long tongue, such as the red clover, which is an important crop. And bumblebees also outperform honeybees in greenhouse environments. This, image, this video that you see before you is actually a bumblebee latched onto a um, Sol Solanum dulcamera, which is native to Europe and Asia. And it's actually vibrating its body against the flowers to cause pollen to be released onto its body. And honeybees are unable to do this. So this act of what we call buzz pollination has made bumblebees very useful to growers. And bumblebees in particular are very good at working in greenhouse settings. So this is definitely not a plug. I don't work for BioVest, but this BioVest is definitely part of the history of the domestication of bumblebees. You see, Dr. Dejongi founded this company, BioVest, and developed Bombus terrestris as a commercial pollinator in 1987. So again, the history of bumblebee domestication is actually quite recent. It's not as old as the honeybee domestication uh, product. In fact, since 1987, there have been more than 20 crops that have been pollinated by commercial bumblebees. There's documentation of more than 20 crops that have benefited from commercially produced bumblebees. In fact, the greenhouse tomato is a major crop and has benefited significantly from the pollination of bum by bumblebees. And um, this research on the history of bumblebee domestication can be read more clearly in this review article by Belthaus and Van Dorn that was published in 2006. So why did bumblebee po domestication take so long when you think about it in relative to honeybees? Well, unlike honeybees, the real reason why most people domesticated bumblebees is to deliver pollination services because bumblebees don't really produce commercial quantities of uh, honey. Um, they not unlike honeybees, which are really good at producing honey uh, to survive the winter. Um, but bumblebees, they don't do that. We can't really extract that resource. Uh, there's not a large volume of honey that, that you produce. Um, they're also a challenging group to domesticate. They have an annual life cycle. They restart every year, whereas honeybees can take multiple years. You can have multiple, you can manage a honey, a honeybee hive for multiple years. Bumblebees, at this point, we can't do that. That's not part of their natural history. They also live a very cryptic lifestyle. They nest underground and they can nest in a tree hole. So it's very hard to access them. It's very hard to find them. They're also hard to move around. Unlike honeybees where you can move a, a box of frames, um, bumblebees, you would actually, they, they, don't, they don't work well in frames. They can't do that. So bumblebees, while they're very exciting and obviously have great value to agriculture, they are a challenging group to domesticate. However, there has been significant success since 1987 in their domestication. In fact, across the globe, at least 30 different companies have produced, successfully produced bumblebees to deliver uh, pollination services to agricultural crops. This one company, BioVest, I found out um, based on some numbers um, published in a journal called Hort Daily, estimates that 10,000 colonies of one species of European bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, leaves their one facility in Belgium um, every week, 10,000. And to give you some perspective there, um, and I apologize, I didn't do a peso um, um, calculation, but in the United States, one colony can run you about 250 US dollars. Starting in 1992, two North American bumblebee species, Bombus occidentalis on your left and Bombus impatiens on your right, were evaluated for commercial production to deliver pollination services to agricultural crops in the United States. And so you can see here, Bombus impatiens is actually buzz pollinating a tomato flower that's being grown in a greenhouse. 
This is the range of both of those species. You can see Bombus occidentalis is primarily distributed in the western portion of the United States and Canada, whereas Bombus and patient syndrome is primarily distributed on the eastern portion of the North American continent. So these two species already were naturally delineated and they could serve the growers of their respective regions to, to grow um, whatever crop the growers were interested in, such as tomatoes or bell peppers or even blueberries. However, shortly after 1997, the commercial production of Bombus occidentalis was abandoned by major producers due to an infestation of Nosema bombi in the commercial stock. The bumblebee microsporidium Nosema bombi is an obligate intracellular pathogen that produces systemic disease in its host, in the bumblebee host. The effects are generally chronic, including reduction in individual reproduction rate, reduction in the lifespan of workers and reproductives, and the reduction of colony growth. This pathogen can infect diverse tissues, including the malphigian tubules, the thorax muscles, and the fat body. And essentially, once you get a really bad infection within a colony, it rapidly spreads through feces and through decaying carcasses. So basically, it's a really bad thing when a bumblebee colony gets infected with Nosema bombi. Almost a decade later, in 2006, the late Dr. Robin Thorpe, who you see in this photo here of UC University of California, Davis, noticed a concerning trend on a mountain in Oregon uh, in the United States. And what he found was that one species of bumblebee, Bombus franklini, was no longer being detected. In fact, Bombus franklini, which is restricted to this area of Oregon, hasn't been detected since 2006. In addition to Bombus franklini declining, its sister species, Bombus occidentalis, was also declining. In fact, Bombus occidentalis's range has dramatic has. Um, uh, has um, retracted throughout much of the Western United States. So you can see this dotted line here represents areas where Bombus occidentalis hasn't been found for quite some time or are relatively low in abundance. So part of my graduate work uh, several years ago now was to test the bumblebee decline hypothesis. And um, this picture, these bumblebees before you represent bees that were either stable or no evidence for decline, as well as bees that were experiencing decline. So the gold stars represent bees that were okay. There's no evidence to suggest decline. And then the red one, the red arrowed bees uh, represent bees that are suspect, suspected of decline. So to uh, test this hypothesis, to engage this question further, my goal as a student at the time was to go through museum specimens and identify and determine the identity of bumblebees within the collections, and then digitize the label data found on those museum specimens. And I basically relate all that information into a barcode um, and then put that into a database that anybody can have access to. So this was my uh, portion of my graduate career, going to museum collections, pulling out drawers of insects, looking at the species determinations, databasing all the label information, putting that into a database, and then most importantly, making that freely available uh, to the public, to anywhere in the world. So uh, in my case, all of this data is deposited on the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and is free to download. In totality, I visited many regional and national natural history collections and museums. I collected data from a total of 48 different museums, which culminated in more than 73,000 specimens being digitized. In addition to my task of digitizing museum specimens and compiling already digitized specimens, I also conducted standardized surveys with a team of scientists at 382 field sites from 2007 to 2009 in 41 US states. Over the course of those three years, we collected a total of 16,000 bumblebees, but that roughly averages to about 40 bees per site at any given moment. So we weren't really concerned at that point about any evidence of over collection, and that really wasn't on our radar. But when we compared our museum data that we collected plus this contemporary survey data, what our analyses found was that in fact five bumblebee species are currently in decline, there has been a decline of between 23 and 87% in their geographic ranges of those five species. 
and up to 96% decline in relative abundance when you compare museum data to contemporary surveys. So today it's 2021, it's been a bit of time since the, uh, we published that research. And we've learned now that additional species are being considered for protection in the United States at both the federal level, as well as within different, uh, different states. However, there is emerging evidence that what we understand about what makes a species unique, distinct, or a good species is not as clear as, many, as you may think. And I think this is a challenge that many entomologists who work in taxonomy and systematics know very well. For example, on the image before you, how many different bumblebee species do you see? Some people might say one, some might say four. Um, and based off of both uh, clear taxonomy, uh, uh, the, the people who generated the taxonomies and systematics of it, there are four different bumblebees here before you. They just all look really similar. Um, so how to distinguish them requires a taxonomist to dig in and really clarify because bumblebees are tricky. There is a degree of phenotype convergence across different species. And the challenge is because of that convergence of phenotype um, patterns within bumblebees, there is a long history of taxonomic disputes as to what makes a good species. Because color variation within the bombus, within the bumblebees, is the primary taxonomic character for classification. And this challenge was really what inspired some of the research that I pursued during my graduate work. Because as we all know, morphology can be very misleading, especially when it comes to bumblebees. And while there are other types of non-color traits that we can use, including the position of the ocelli on the face or the, look, um, the orientation of different types of um, uh, um, structures on the body, there is a long history of using color as a way to differentiate between species of bumblebee. So of course, this um, concern, this interesting story about what makes a good species is definitely not just mine. This is a story that's been going on for a long time. In fact, well before I even started graduated, graduate school, uh, Sydney Cameron and her colleagues in 2003 published a paper looking at this particular species group, this Bombus, California, uh, this Bombus fervidus species group, and based off of three gen genes, three fra gene fragments, they suggest that both Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus are two distinct species. And when you look at them, it kind of makes sense, right? We have this dark species here, Bombus californicus, mostly black, and then Bombus fervidus, which is mostly yellow. So it seems like a pretty done deal. There's no real concern that uh, you, you could get confused between the two. And then of course, the phylogeny or the bee tree of life here is suggesting very strong support for two distinct species. But again, as you all know, life is very fascinating and always likes to throw us curveballs. So here again, if you were to really sample the geographic distribution of these bumblebees, what we end up finding is that there's actually a lot of variation even between these two extreme color forms. So again, we've got Bombus, what we would call Bombus californicus here on the far left. This, this is the dorsum of their metasoma. It's much, it's dark, as you can tell, as you've already seen. Whereas with Bombus fervidus, again, the, this is their dorsum here. It's very yellow and looks obviously quite different than Bombus californicus. Between the two, we see there's a degree of almost like a gradient, a lot of variation that exists. Um, and certainly more variation than, um, than I'm presenting today. So in 2015, because of this extreme variation and because of some other lines of genetic evidence, Paul Williams and his co-authors in 2015 synonymized Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus as one species based on the species bar. So today uh, I'm gonna present a little bit about that story using some of my own um, investigation and using different genetic tools to determine uh, and test hypotheses of whether they're one, two or something else uh, some other number of species within the Bombus fervidus species group. So again, as you've known, um, this uh, Paul Williams and his co-authors presented this one species idea that Bombus fervidus is uh, just a very polymorphic uh, single species. Whereas uh, Sydney Cameron's uh, 2003 paper suggests that there are two distinct species. We've got the mostly yellow Bombus fervidus 
And the uh, black bombus californicus with a lot of variability uh, as well, including a lot more yellow than the more dark bombus californicus that um, a lot of people are familiar with. And then finally, there is this third hypothesis that has been, flown, uh, has been um, floated, this idea that when Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus co-occur, when they're sympatric, they produce a viable hybrid, uh, what people, some people call as Bombus californicus consanguinis. So here I'm presenting three distinct hypotheses that I aim to use genetic tools to test, to determine you know, which hypotheses can we support based off of genetic data. So my questions were, are Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus, are they distinct species? And then my second question that I want to present to you today is, is Bombus californicus consanguinus a phenotypic integrate, a hybrid between Bombus californicus and fervidus? And I had uh, two other questions uh, that I pursued during my doctoral work, but I'm not going to go into uh, that uh, particularly today. So of course, um, a good biologist uh, would always go back to the Natural History Museum to see what they can find about uh, the species of interest. And that's always a good thing to do, uh, to work with your curators on finding um, specimens. So this is the map of Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus distributions in uh, the United States. Bombus fervidus is in green. So you can see that Bombus fervidus is found from California all the way uh, on the West Coast, all the way to New York and Massachusetts and Washington DC on the East Coast. Whereas Bombus californicus in orange is primarily found in the western portion of the United States and only goes as far east as South Dakota um, uh, and the Black Hills. So what I did with that information was I took a subset of that, uh, that data and I genotyped 373 individuals. Um, and this is a map of that distribution. And what you can see here is that the color uh, on this map is representing a specific phenotype that I've classified. So we've got the dark green, the light green, the yellow, and the orange. And you can see that in some cases at a specific field site, you can have multiple phenotypes occurring in one spot. The size of the circle, finally, represents the number of individuals that I collected at that one spot. So the larger the circle, the more individuals I captured you know, for my research. I extracted DNA from the mid leg of females of, of those 300 some specimens using a modified Kelex method. I amplified the DNA using polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And I genotype these bees at 13 microsatellite loci that have been described in the literature. And then finally scored the data using a program called Genius. So here I'm gonna show you a, what we call a principal component analysis. So basically each dot that you see on this graph represents a single individual. And the closer the dots are to each other suggests that they're more similar. Uh, that's the general takeaway that I'd like to present today. I also color coded uh, these uh, dots to represent um, two distinct groups, what I'm calling group B and gray and group C and orange. And the first thing that emerged to me um, in this analysis is that I see two distinct clouds of dots. I think that's quite, I mean, there's definitely a little bit in the middle, but in general, we see these two distinct clusters, potentially suggesting that there are two distinct species. But what I found, of course, when I looked closely at the individuals that were assigned these different clusters was that I found phenotypes that were present um, in both group B and group C. The exact same phenotypes, this yellow phenotype here, was also found in, in the gray cloud, as well as the orange cloud. And this was also true for the black phenotype. I found the black phenotype distributed in the orange cloud, as well as the gray cloud. So already, we're seeing some interesting patterns that both phenotypes can be found in different genetic clusters. I also use another algorithm, another analysis to, to account for evolutionary, bio evolutionary history of these species with the program called structure. So each line on this graph represents again, a single individual. And again, just like my PCA uh, principal components analysis, I found group C clustered um, with, uh, differently than the group B cluster. So again, we, there's some evidence, there's evidence to support this idea that there are two genetic clusters um, again, group C in orange and group B in gray. And that multiple phenotypes or converging phenotypes can be found in each cluster. 
when you look at this spatially, when you look at this on a map, again, you can see that when you go from California, and in this case to uh, Virginia, this group C cluster can be found um, from coast to coast. Whereas this group B cluster is only found um, from California down again to the Black Hills of South Dakota. So while um, there, are, so we, what we're seeing is a, a very common picture where we have a very I, a regionally isolated group here, genetic cluster here, and then one that goes from coast to coast. To add inference, to add support to this hypothesis that we were testing, I used three additional markers. Um, to test my hypotheses of, you know, of, of these species groups. So I sequenced a subset of the data available. I sequenced uh, uh, three mitochondrial gene fragments across 64 specimens. I used the barcoding gene, of course, because it's been a very useful gene for species determination, but I've also used two additional mitochondrial genes that have been useful um, with, when um, differentiating across bumblebees, the gene 12S and the gene 16S. And with these three genes, I constructed a we constructed a phylogeny. So the first thing uh, that really comes out again in this phylogeny in this B tree of life is that there is very strong support for two distinct genetic groups. Again, group B and group C, 100% support at this node here. And each line here again represents an individual. And what we're finding, like our microsatellite data is that when you look at group B and group C, again, we see pheno the uh, evidence for this black phenotype here, this dark phenotype in both group B and group C. And you probably guessed it already. We also saw the yellow phenotype existing within group B and group C. Finally, we also found evidence across the phylogeny for a degree of geographic structuring across populations. So essentially, when we look at the phylogeny, there is an evidence that populations are geographically structured uh, using these three mitochondrial genes. So going back to that question, you know, those were, I have two questions in the beginning. Are Bombus californicus and Bombus fervidus this thing taxa? Well, at this point, the answer is yes and no. And that is because what we're finding out right now is that both phenotypes, what we classically have described as Bombus californicus being this dark uh, inset bumblebee and Bombus fervidus being this yellow bumblebee, we're finding both phenotypes existing within two genetic lineages, within two genetic clusters. So now there is a strong need to go back and revisit the taxonomy and to reanalyze and to look at the data that's available to make some decisions on what, the, what species we're looking at. So that's why it's a yes and a no. Furthermore, the second question is, is Bombus californicus consanguinus some phenotypic integrate between californicus and fervidus? And based on both microsatellite data and mitochondrial data, there really is no evidence to support that there's hybridization. In fact, what we've learned is that when you go to a single site, we can actually see two very distinct um, populations co-occurring that also exhibit very different phenotypes. So at this point, there is no evidence to support hybridization of these two species. So in conclusion to this project, group B and group C have distinct evolutionary histories based on microsatellite and mitochondrial DNA. We also suggest that Bombus californicus consanguinus is not some hybrid or phenotypic integrate. It is evident that there's convergence of color phenotypes. The taxonomy remains unresolved, and this is something that we can move forward with. Um, and finally, because we're dealing with two different species, potentially, um, based on the genetic data, we need to explore different, there are different responses to disease and habitat degradation because they can be quite different. They're distributed geographically quite different and therefore might encounter pressures differently. So the next steps that my group uh, is taking with other collaborators is to conduct whole genome sequencing and resequencing of extant uh, Bombus fervidus uh, and Bombus californicus populations. And the goal of using whole genome sequencing to, uh, to, with these species is to clarify species relationships, to have a more broad brush stroke across the genome. I'm also interested with, uh, our collaborators are also interested and myself are at identifying specific genes that are associated with color evolution within this particular species concept, uh, complex. Because what we've learned with color is that color slowly emerges as the adult um, uh, matures um, as an offspring in the colony. 
So this is something that we can work more on um, in the lab. In addition to whole genome sequencing, we're also doing research uh, in our lab on bumblebee rearing. And there's a whole host of questions we can ask about um, species and rearing. We can study their mating behavior. We can study colon differences in colony survival, oh. colony and energetics, um, and colony behavior. So these are um, projects that are slowly um, coming to fruition in our lab. So as promised, you know, the next project I want to discuss briefly is on some work that I've done uh, in the uh, worked in the Philippines uh, with uh, my collaborator, Dr. David General. Um, and to be honest, you know, it's been it's been very exciting, and I'm happy that um, I can kind of come back and think about, you know, learn more about my heritage, but also learn more about the biodiversity that's found on these islands. You know, I've only gone home a couple of times as an adult, so I'm really excited about learning more about the biodiversity that's found in the Philippines. So I was ecstatic when um, Dr. David General agreed to collaborate on this project and introduced me <laughs> gently to the bumblebees of the Philippines. And that collaboration culminated into a paper that we published together in 2018, where we conducted a preliminary assessment of bumblebee habitat suitability across protected and unprotected areas in the Philippines. In the Philippines, there are at least two described species of bumblebee, Bombus aracinensis. This is a photo that uh, Dr. General took um, that we eventually published actually uh, as in a paper uh, this past year. Um, uh, and then there's Bombus flavescens here on the right. So these are the two described species of bumblebee that are found in the Philippines. And what uh, Dr. General and I did was we compiled data from online resources and he digitized records from the collection and what we did was we conducted um, a preliminary model of habitat suitability using this data and using climate data with the software called Maxin. And I do say it's preliminary because we still need to add hopefully more museum specimens, uh, more digitized specimens, hopefully uh, to this uh, data set. So the maps you see before you are those habitat suitability maps. The darker the color you see on the map means higher habitat suitability. Whereas the lighter the color you see on the map represents low habitat suitability. So places you won't probably find the bumblebee. And maybe the first thing that pops out at you is that bumblebee habitat suitability is highest in mountainous places, in mountainous regions. So what we were interested in determining was, well, how does habitat suitability of these two bumblebee species intersect with the mountainous geography of the Philippines, as well as areas that are protected um, in the Philippines? So we look, we took those habitat suitability models and then we took elevation data and protected area data. And we were interested in learning, you know, you know is there a relationship between bumblebees and elevation? Is there any patterns uh, across protected areas? And what we found um, in, our, in our paper was that the models predict that habitat suitability for Philippine bumblebees, Bombus um, irisinensis and flavescens are highest in mountainous regions. And we also found that habitat suitability um, is distributed, a high habitat suitability is distributed between 28 and 24,000 square kilometers um, across these 114 protected land parcels in the Philippines. And you know, you know, I was looking at the paper the other day again to kind of to prepare for this seminar. And it was really exciting again to, to, to discover that, you know, um, bumblebee habitat suitability, uh, specifically for um, Bombus irisinensis, uh, is quite high. Um, in, in northern Luzon, and actually quite high in the Nueva Vizcaya region, which is where my father is from. So it's kind of fun to, to draw that connection again, that bumblebees basically have been in my family for quite some time. I just didn't know about it. So I'm excited about this opportunity to continue collaborating with scientists at the University of Philippine Los Banos on bee projects, specifically bumblebees. And I think there's a whole host of other ideas and projects that can be explored, of course, uh, that involve, you know, potentially whole genome sequencing or revisiting the systematics of bumblebees or conducting population genetic studies, and even just finding, you know, learning more about their ecology and colony biology. So I'm really excited and interested in learning more, um, digging into the literature more on these species, and of course, learning from the experts there. So, you know, ultimately, the impact I've believed in over the, my 14 plus years of studying bees 
is that you know, by through collaboration um, across disciplines, across universities, and even across countries, this will uh, allow scientists to work with growers, to work with farmers to sustain our planet's agroecosystems and our natural resources. And truly by conducting these scientific investigations on biodiversity has the capacity to ensure and inform the stewardship of wild and managed bees and natural and agricultural ecosystems. So I just wanna leave you with this video of a Bombus huntii foraging here in Logan, Utah during the summer on what we call Lacey Facelia. And of course it's in slow motion. So they don't move that slow typically. So with that, maraming salama for your kind attention. I would like to thank you for your attention during my seminar. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. And of course, feel free to email me should you have any questions or ideas that you would like to share. Thank you very much. Wow. Oh, thank you, Sir John, for that great presentation. And we are really excited to learn more uh, during uh, this, this, this uh, discussion that we will be having. Uh, but before we go to our open forum, let me just introduce our special guest moderator, uh, Dr. Amy Lynn Dupo. So interesting fact, Dr. Dupo actually started, started her career, academic career, as an extension associate of the UPLB Museum of Natural History. So she eventually joined the Institute of Biological Sciences as a faculty, rising through the ranks and uh, reached the position of professor just last year, Professor Ten. Uh, even though she's busy with her teaching and administrative duties as a former leader of the UPLB B program and the secretary of the UPLB graduate school, uh, Dr. Dupo has remained an ever active uh, curator of the museum, taking care of the spider and moth collections. So our moderator is indeed special as she is the current faculty regent of the whole UP system. So friends, let us all welcome honorable Faculty Regent Dr. Amy Lynn Barion Dupo. Ma'am Amy. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Floor. Hi, ma so uh, we have one question in the chat box or in our QA. Uh, I'm going to read it. Hi, my name is Jasper from Central Luzon State University. I'm curious how researchers. Uh, were able to determine the habitat suitability for each species. Did you use climate data to check the suitability for the bees? Hi, thank you so much for that question, Jasper. Um, it's a wonderful question, and it's certainly a question that I've worked with uh, for a bit of time and have had the honor to work with different students. So yes, um, in order to determine the habitat suitability of different species, what I essentially I did was I took museum data that um, had latitude and longitude associated with it. And then I took climate data that was freely available on the web. And then I combined the two and I used a, a program called Maxent to estimate habitat suitability. So there is capacity to take basically any variable you want. In my case, I took climate to estimate habitat suitability of bumblebees. But you can certainly do this with any species. And uh, one thing more with Maxent that's useful is that unlike um, other algorithms, Maxent um, has the capacity to use just presence data. So you don't need absence data. You don't need to know where a bee isn't. If you just know where a bee is, this algorithm can go ahead and estimate habitat suitability. So museum data is a perfect uh, data set that you can use uh, to estimate habitat suitability. So thank you, Jasper, for that question. Sure, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, if I may ask, uh, while we are waiting for other questions to come in, can you use the same habitat suitability data to, to find where the bees are? Uh, while we have very few records of bumblebees in the Philippines, uh, because we are an island country, we do expect to find a lot, uh, a lot more new ones here. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, that is a wonderful question. And actually, um, what's exciting about that is that it actually has helped me a bit. Um, so in the past, I, um, um, there was this one bumblebee in North America. It was called Bombus silvicola. And people have been studying bumblebees in North America for quite some time. Um, but there's this particular portion in, the, in Washington state where this bumblebee has never been discovered before. 
No one's ever documented it with the exception of one record in like the 1930s, but just one, you know, just one record. And I went back there as a graduate student and I found this species occupying a place that no one's ever described it from. Even in the literature, no one's ever said it was there. And what's fascinating is that the habitat suitability model does predict it to be there. So yes, to answer your question, habitat suitability models have the capacity to identify areas that are under surveyed or understudied. Uh, and I have, um, I do think that my scenario is a, a good example of that, that it is possible. So yes. Thank you. That will be very useful for our students and also our viewers this morning who wish to study uh, the bumblebees. We have uh, one comment question here from Everett John Roberts. Who else is studying bumblebees in the Philippines? Do we have any data on their status? Unfortunately, to my knowledge, um, it's only Jonathan and uh, Dave General uh, who have been trying to uh, produce knowledge more on our bumblebees in the Philippines. Uh, in terms of the UPLBB program, much of the research we have focused on uh, the commercial bees and the native bees in the form of your tetragonula and also your uh, the native apis species. But in terms of bumblebees, I think it's only Dave and Jonathan who has been focusing their energy group. Yes, so I mean, if, uh, if there are other folks out, and then of course, <laughs> Everett as well. So yes, yeah. I'm definitely interested in uh, connecting people and learning more about what people are up to, because I think there's a, there's a fascinating opportunity here. Um, if I may, there was a, you know, in my research on bumblebees, because I was very curious, like what literature is available? And I think um, in my research, and I, you know, it's hard to know what's available sometimes as you, as you search for things on the internet. And I think I was only really able to find four papers published uh, on the topic of bumblebees of the Philippines. It's very limited resources, at least to my knowledge in the journals that I could find. So if there's any resources that anyone knows of, you know, I'd be happy to engage with that. Um, one thing that I did find though in my studies, in my research uh, of Philippine bumblebees was that um, it seems that in 1908, the people, um, I think the U.S. Americans actually brought a bumblebee species from the United States into the Philippines to see if it could pollinate red clover in northern Luzon. And I, this information I never published in my paper, but it is available. It was a, I found it in an old um, almanac from 1900s. And I was very fascinating. They never described the species they tried to introduce, and they suggested that it probably just died out. So that's a very curious thing that someone actually tried to bring in a bumblebee into the Philippines that's not native to the area. Um, but to my knowledge, no one has seen it and I haven't heard anything since. But uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity for study, of course. Yes, thank you. And uh, Dr. Roberts, yes, of course, uh, including you. But uh, you would like, uh, maybe you would like to use this opportunity to invite our attendees to pursue more studies on bumblebees because we need all the help that we can get. And um, for uh, Dr. Dave General and Dr. Jonathan, um, is something that if you're, most of our students or attendees are actually students, if you were given a chance to promote or sell bumblebee studies, especially in the Philippines. How do you go about selling this group? Uh, selling them for commercial purposes? No, I mean, uh, just to promote their studies. Um, most of our students oh. are, uh, you really have to do a bit of sales talk to get them interested. Yes, yes. Um, that's a good question. So I think it's, um, for me, what we've learned, what I've learned so far is bumblebee these are pretty brightly colored just kind of going back to let's just go back there a little bit to these very brightly colored insects you know there's still a lot of room to determine whether there really are only two species of bumblebee in the philippines um, that is still not well understood there to my knowledge not there's no genetic data on these species just yet so that's one opportunity for discovery um, the systematics, I think, are not very well worked out yet. And also, you know, to my knowledge, um, at least in the published literature, I haven't seen any information on how they form colonies. 
So in that, um, that video I showed earlier, you, you see the bumblebee colonies, you see them interacting. So I think there's a lot of room even just to try to bring in bumblebees into the, from the field, if you can go find the queen and, and try to rear them yourself, see what they do, see how easy they are to rear. Now that's one way you can interact with a live insect. So I think there's that room for opportunity to just simply describe their colony biology. Um, but if you don't want to work with a stinging insect, you know, you can also go out into the field and take photographs of these bees when you do see them and then identify what kind of flowering plants are they on? You know, or what kind of poly, what, what, what are the potential of uh, plants that they pollinate? To my knowledge, there is not a lot of information on even the interactions between bumblebees and flowers. Um, and then finally, as you described, um, Professor, there's um, not a lot of data just yet available. So I think uh, for students, there's a lot of um, opportunity to go out. If you have a, a, if have access to a camera, you can take photos of bees and upload them to a website if you'd like. But if you want to be more interactive, you can actually go out if it's possible to look for queens and try to rear them yourself. So I think there's a lot of great opportunity and. What I want to also um, provide or, uh, or make myself available to the students, if they have any specific questions uh, on anything Bumblebee, please feel free to email me if you have a question uh, uh, about Bumblebees. I'm happy to um, engage as well. In social media accounts, um, IG, so that the students can also interact with you fast. Yes, definitely. Yeah, those can all be made available. I can... Uh, I can I can bring I can uh, submit give you that information yes. <laughs> uh, if you also have uh, information regarding inheritance patterns for colors of bumblebees, uh, maybe some of our students who are biologists and are majoring in genetics would like to work with you sometime. Oh yes, certainly. I think there's so much opportunity here to study bumblebees and color variation. So there's a lot. There's a lot more work, <laughs> a lot of work to do if, if, if people are interested, yes. Yes, I agree. Uh, just a contribution of add a few more species to two would be a great achievement for Philippine biodiversity. Oh, I, yes, I, yes. I would not be surprised if there are more than two species. <laughs> okay, so I think we don't have any additional questions for this morning, but should you have have um, uh, other curious questions for our speaker this morning, uh, you can always reach him through email and he also promises to share with you his social media account so that you can interact with him, uh, I think, uh, on a regular basis. And again, the challenge is to add more species to the two that we have now. Remember that we are uh, an island country and we expect that based on the data that they have found through habitat suitability, we expect to find more in the Philippines. Okay, thank you, Bam Amy, uh, for moderating the open forum and Sir Jonathan, uh, congratulations on this great presentation. So before we end our program, let me just uh, do the traditional giving of uh, virtual certificates. So, Maraming salamat uh, to Sir Jonathan and to our moderator, Regent Dupo, and of course to all our, uh, to all of everyone here present, our audience. We are, uh, we're gonna award this certificate of recognition to Dr. Jonathan Kosh Uhad for serving as a resource person during the 2021 MNH Biodiversity Seminar. Uh, entitled Ang Kwento ng Dalawang Bubuyog. So for the benefit of uh, our non-Filipino speaking friends, uh, it's the story of two bumblebees. How genetics can illuminate the fantastic diversity of bumblebees. Held today, March 12, 2021, 10 to 11.30 a.m. Philippine Standard Time via Zoom. So in witness whereof, the signature of the director is here unto affixed, given Today, March 12, at UPLB College Laguna, Philippines, signed by our director, Juan Carlos T. Gonzalez. So, um, everyone, I've already posted at the Q&A, or rather at the chat box, the link to the evaluation form. Make sure that you answer it before 3 p.m. today. So, just click on it and try your best to answer it as soon as possible. Or you could just go... 
uh, use this bit.ly link. So go to bit.ly slash 2021-bss-eval and we will be accepting responses only until 3 p.m. So um, we invite you to go to our website. It's at uh, mnh.uplb.edu.ph. If you want to drop us an email, right at mnh.uplb at up.edu.ph. We are present in Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So just look for the handle UPLB Museum and uh, check our articles at uh, Wikipedia and uh, TripAdvisor. So again, a reminder, uh, the recording of this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So uh, just uh, go to youtube.com slash UPLB Museum, try to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll be notified when the recording will be uploaded. So maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat, Sir John and uh, Ma'am Amy and to our support staff at the ITC, si Roy. Uh, maraming salamat po sa, sa inyong lahat and we wish you a nice weekend ahead. Thank you very much.